Let's begin. Okay. All right. Bye. Hello and welcome to this interview with Michael Fenton, whose work is presently on display at Alpha Art Gallery's solo exhibition. My name is Kira Edgar, and together we're going to be going over some of Michael Fenton's artistic process, as well as the pieces graciously contributed to both our physical and online presentations. We're going to start off pretty simple. Michael, how are you today? I'm good. Good to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. A little bit rainy, but that's okay. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's also rainy over here. But speaking of our weather and our background, can you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you initially get into art and what led you to begin your career as an artist? Um, that's a, an interesting question. Um, I, I always liked to draw. I can remember all the way back when I was a kid, I used to draw these complicated kinds of things, cartoonies cartoons kind of thing. Uh, and in high school, what passed for a guidance counselor in those days uh, suggested that I might uh, want to consider commercial art as a, uh, a line of study. And uh, I really didn't know what commercial art was. But when I uh, did a little research, uh, I, I decided that you can't make a living doing that. Uh, so I went on to business school um, and uh, <clears throat> did my time uh, in the military. Uh, and then I worked in the corporate world for 30 plus years. Uh, <clears throat> and when I retired, it was on my birthday. Uh, and uh, this was about 1999, something like that. Uh, and my wife gave me uh, a birthday present of uh, a whole new set of paints and an easel and, you know, the, all the accoutrements. And uh, I hadn't done much painting while I was, or any kind of art while I was working because it just didn't never had the time kind of a thing. Uh, but once I picked up the brush, uh, I realized that uh, this was a lot better feeling uh, than anything I had experienced up to then. And so I've just been painting ever since. So I guess, uh, you know, pretty much uh, self-taught, uh, never, <clears throat> never really studied art in a formal way, but I've had a lot of studio classes and taken some, you know, taken art history uh, uh, classes at one, one college or another in the area. Uh, so, but it's, you know, generally self-taught and what I could steal from other artists who, uh, uh, you know, who I've met over the years and art associations that I've been in. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty much the background. Um, I guess there's a realization I had was that, <clears throat> you need to learn what your passion is. Um, and, and sometimes you don't know what it is until it happens. Uh, some people, it's a musical instrument. Some people, it's singing. And in my case, there was this latent need, essentially to draw, uh, which turned into a painting. And when I got to when I had the time to actually do it, I realized that I should have been doing it, you know, uh, my whole uh, my whole career. I should have found the time uh, in addition to my work to, to do my painting. So I always tell people, whatever your passion is, you know, don't don't give it up or don't ignore it because uh, it's what keeps you sane, I think. <laughs> And uh, it's really been helpful to me in that regard. Uh, so that's you know pretty much my background. Uh, grew up, well, you don't need to know where I grew up, but it was small town kind of stuff, you know. 
did that small town space like and setting influence your work or like change your perspective on art? I don't think so. Um, I, if, if anything, it might have retarded uh, any anything I had. It was when I got out to see the world more. Um, I did my military service in Europe, uh, so I got to I got to see that aspect of of the world. Uh, and then, of course, I've been living in the New York City general area since 1960. So it's just more metropolitan. And I think there's more people and there's more exposure to things uh, than you get in a small town in upstate New York, uh, which is, in artistic terms, that's the world of landscape painting. And the stuff I like is people. And in a more metropolitan kind of environment, there are more people and more people to look at and and see those kind of things. And that's the kind of stuff I like to paint. That's really interesting. So this is sort of, this space has allowed you to kind of like blossom in your, your cre creativity and like really take this career and pursue it seriously. Well, it's been a lot more satisfying than my business career hasn't paid. Obviously it hasn't been as lucrative, uh, but it's just been a lot more satisfying. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have all of these people that you're like observing and taking inspiration from. How do you choose the subject matter for your paintings on your website that you, you mentioned that it's like mostly personal or based on your own memories? Um, well, people interest me and I, and I watch people um, and, and I, I like looking at photographs, uh, old ones um, and new ones, but mostly old ones. Um, and I discovered, courtesy of the Internet, uh, mostly, that the photography from Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, uh, is fascinating to me. The, the people are much more interesting looking, uh, at least the ones that the photographers choose. Um, and I've always sort of viewed the, the, the human face. And I, and I use the term, it's the landscape of the soul. And the older the face, the better, the better the landscape. They, because, you know, when you get, as you, if you live life, you have more experiences and more, every line on your face has some symbolic meaning. And of course, uh, I just, I find it fascinating. So I've, I do tons of drawings of old people. And it, a lot of it is inspired by these photographs of farmers and peasants and, and people sitting on the street uh, in the European countries. And uh, I, I just find that the, the kind of sensitivity I see in the photographs taken particularly in, in Europe, are really different than the ones you see in the, in the United States or in the Western countries. Um, I don't think the people are that much different. I just think the photographers seem to be different. Uh, most of the stuff, for example, in the United States is airbrushed and doctored and, and everything's about uh, beauty and flawlessness uh, and, and and it's not natural, but as you if you go to the uh, European countries, even the Scandinavian countries, uh, you will you don't see as much airbrushing, you don't see as much emphasis on uh, cheesecake kind of stuff, um, uh, and you see people as they really are, just coming out of the fields, sitting in the barn shucking whatever they shuck, uh, old women in the kitchen at sewing machines, and their faces are beautiful. 
they just show that they've lived life. And I just find that fascinating. So I, I get a lot of ideas from that and from the folk tales and the stories that come out of those countries. Uh, and, and it sort of gets my mind working. And then I will use an element from one photograph. I'll invent something else. I'll make, you know, adjustments as you go along, but, uh, that's kind of what I do. And then a the picture will speak to me. Uh, there'll be an emotion. There'll be something in the person's eyes. Uh, there'll be something in the, the way the body, uh, the posture of the body, all those things kind of click something in my, in my head. And I said, well, suppose I do this and I add this and I do that. And, and then I just start painting and, or drawing and I see where it takes me. And uh, most of the time it gets me someplace I like, but every once in a while, you know, I get down, go down a blind alley uh, and uh, it, it's not, doesn't make me happy, but uh, it's just a journey, you know. Uh, and then uh, if somebody looks at a face that I've done or a person that I've done and they comment or they can comment on it reminds them of something or they have an emotion or whatever, then I, at least I'm, I feel I've been successful. So that's how I do that. <clears throat> I guess like in a sense, that sort of like that barrier that you're observing between photography in the United States and photography elsewhere is this maybe like, kind of parallel to the barrier between commercial and fine art, like the kind of commodification of, of the, of person, like of the face versus the honest depiction of stories and souls that you're trying to capture and trying to get people to recognize. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. It's not necessarily visual art. That's maybe a theater art kind of a thing. Um, thanks to the COVID lockdown, uh, I've watched, been watching a lot of uh, foreign uh, television, stuff from France, stuff from Scandinavia and Germany, um, and England, uh, a lot of. But a lot of it's in another language, a language that I don't, you know, that I don't speak. And fortunately, they got captions at the bottom. But when you look at the actors and you look at the stories, they're, they're wildly different than the stuff that comes out of America. Um, uh, American movies, for example, um, you know, and God help me, all the women look alike and all the men look alike. And I can't tell, and it's not just my age, I can't tell one actress from another unless she's very unusual looking. You know, I can, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of somebody that, that stands out. Um, Julia Roberts, for example, looks different than most of the other actresses. So I, you know, but, but everybody else, they look the same and they all got the same name. Everybody's, you know, uh, uh, got these, whatever the name, all the guys are named Scott or whatever, you know, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And they all look alike and the stories are all the same. And there's a lot of blood and there's a lot of explosions and there's a lot of artificiality. When you watch a European detective show, the, the, the male lead, for example, he gets hit by somebody and he falls down and he gets knocked out. Okay. In, in American films, guy gets hit by a truck and he gets up and he continues to fight. A guy gets shot and he continues to fight and there's no reality to anything. Uh, uh, and um, 
but if you watch the European stuff, people get hurt. People don't wear as much makeup. The women aren't as perfect. The men aren't as perfect. They're normal people. And the stories are really interesting. And the art's the same way, and the photography's the same way. Uh, and, and so when I look at a, a photograph, it just doesn't look all touched up and, and you know, airbrushed and whatever. And there, certainly there's, there is a segment of, uh, you know, sex, TNA kind of stuff coming out of uh, Europe. I mean, I look at a lot of uh, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, uh, you know, photography that comes from that part of the world. And they have their share of that kind of stuff. But the overwhelming majority of their, their photography is so different. And so it's, it just, it's much more creative, I think. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of been my experience. And uh, uh, so it's fascinating to me because it's real. So in this reality, you find that your subjects and your inspirations have like a lot more diversity, would you say? Or are, are there like common through lines and threads that connect to your subjects for portraiture? Um, probably, uh, I would say about 80% of my people, and, and most of my work is people, about 80% of it are older or unusual looking people in um, not perfect settings. Uh, I, I, I was fast, I'm fascinated by pre-Raphaelite period. And of course that, that was a, a breakaway from uh, the Victorian stuff. Uh, back then it was called, uh, I think, Victorian pornography, uh, because all of a sudden they got away from all the biblical uh, kinds of paintings and and uh, they featured these uh, women with perfect creamy skin and red hair. And there was a lot more nudes, but none of it was biblical or very little of it was biblical. Um and, and then they got away from that. I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going with that thought, but uh, so I, but I have played with that to see if I could, it's just a test for me. Can I make the skin uh, look the way it looked in a pre-Raphaelite painting? You know, can, do I understand the technique? Uh, I, I've copied Rembrandt's work just to try to understand his brush strokes. And it, it, there are different things. And I, uh, I began to realize why um, art students who are trained classically copy some of the old masters. Uh, I, I'll just tell you a story. My first visit to the Louvre in, uh, in, in Paris was back in the 1960s. And it was fairly shortly after it had reopened, after all of the damage done in the war, and they finally got the collections, you know, the way they wanted it. And it was literally mouse hole to ceiling paintings. You know, they didn't have them all spread out the way they do today. So you, I, I walked in, and it was like paintings everywhere, from the floor to the ceiling. And on, in every gallery area, there was at least one student artist copying one of the masters on the wall. And I particularly remember the Blue Boy painting because there were like three young artists from whatever school in Paris, and they were, they were all copying the Blue Boy. Maybe it was an assignment or maybe, you know, whatever. And I was amazed at how good they looked compared to the original, you know? And, and I mean, and, and I, I didn't really understand then why they were doing it. Why should you copy that, you know? Uh, but then I, you know, when I started painting, 
I realized that you do that to learn the technique of the artist, to learn how the artist use color. Uh, you can kind of walk in that artist's footsteps. Uh, and uh, so I, from time to time, will find some old classic painting uh, and, and I'll, I'll copy it just to see if I could do that. One I did recently, uh, I don't think I'll put it, would put it in the show, but maybe, I don't know. I don't, I don't want it, people accusing me of for, forgery, but there's a painting and I can't even remember the artist in the Metropolitan Museum of, uh, I think it's Salome. And um, uh, she's sitting and she's got, it's all in yellows, yellows and golds. And there's this very, I don't know, I'll call her an unusual looking young woman who that's Salome. Uh, and she's, she's holding an empty, I think she's holding an empty tray where John the Baptist's head's going to go. Yes. Um, and I've always been fascinated with that painting. So one day I said, I'm going to, I'm going to copy that because I'm fascinating with, with the way the colors were used and everything. Um, but when I finished it, I didn't like the face. And, and I, I felt that I, I just had this realization that the face of this woman looked masculine to me. And here's this woman who's supposed to be a temptress. And, and the face looks, you know, just looked like a drag kind of a thing. And, I, and it didn't feel right. And a friend of mine looked at it. And we looked at the original. And they said the same thing. The original looks like that, too. It looks like the model might have been a guy, you know. I mean, I, uh, so, so I, I found, uh, I found an, an actress in Italy uh, whose face I found was fascinating. And if I ever wanted to be, you know, tempted by, you know, a, a siren, a sex siren, that's the face that would tempt me. So I put her face on this painting, you know, just so that it would look the way I wanted it to, I guess. Um, so, you know, you just, you learn from doing that. I don't even know if they, if they do that now in, uh, uh, in, in, you know, art school, whether they even encourage people to copy, uh, you know, the old masters. I think that's, a classic way of teaching, but I don't know that they do it now. I mean, you're probably closer to that than I am. Um, I have actually taken classes where that's encouraged, but I've also taken classes where like more original work is emphasized. I think it depends on like the subject of the class. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. they'll focus more <laughs> on like a commercial angle, but yeah, that's. I mean, I I've only seen. One time in, in the Metropolitan Museum, have I been there when somebody was actually copying something? And it was a friend of mine who happened to be doing it. Um, and she, I guess you pay a fee and you, you know, but back then in the Louvre, you just came in with your stuff and signed in and uh, they even had easels for you. So you didn't have to, wow. you know, uh, I don't know if they still do it, but back then the place was filled with art students. And it was fascinating to me, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it's kind of fun, I guess. Absolutely, it's it's a way to like read vision and kind of the process and kind of like you said, step through that in the artist's shoes. So you've mentioned that the pre-Raphael pre-Raphael movement. Um, influenced your work and that this piece in the Louvre as well um, was a kind of space for you to explore a reimagining of a work. Is there any other like artworks or art periods or movements that really you find yourself referencing or calling back to as you continue your original work or are those like the primary influences? Well, I wouldn't, uh, 
I, I you know, pre-Raphaelite was, uh, I guess, a phase. Um, artists go through phases, I think. Um, you know, Picasso had the blue period, um, that, that, that sort of thing. And, then it, um, and I, I, I get interested in something and I kind of jump into it. I've always liked, um, uh, I like to look at stuff like Botticelli, for example. Uh, uh, I like Rembrandt. I like to look at the old, old classic stuff. Um, uh, and, uh, different aspects of it fascinate me. I, um, you know, the old, uh, religious art, um, um, Caravaggio, uh, you know, uh, there, there was, I was in a church in Italy and I don't remember the name of the church, but there was a, a Caravaggio altarpiece that originally was supposed to be done for another church. But they, Caravaggio used a local prostitute as the model for Mary. And that prostitute was also the mistress of the local, I know, whether he was the priest or uh, a bishop or whatever, you know, whatever his rank was uh and there was a scandal so they they found a different place for it that you know wasn't prominent and i so that's kind of fascinated me so i'd go in there and i'd look at the picture and you know uh it, it, it's a religious picture but the subjects the, the models are were people that they pulled out of uh pubs and bars and side streets and brothels and, you know, uh, uh, men and women. I mean, they just did that. And of course, uh, I, I always wondered uh, the Sistine Chapel, how many of the figures in the Sistine Chapel, the models were, uh, you know, people that maybe the church wouldn't have approved of uh, back in, in that day. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like that I'm Rembrandt influence. I like the, the style of Rembrandt's paintings. I was fascinated with that for a while. Um, I did a copy of a, one of his self portraits early on. Um, and, uh, it's an interesting story. I, I always felt guilty about doing it. Felt like somehow I was forging something, although I never, you know, took credit. It was just a copy. But when I had to move and downsize, that was one of the paintings that I got rid of. I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to ever try and sell it. Uh, so it was just taking up space and it was pretty big. And I, uh, I donated it and a bunch of others to, um, uh, I don't know, it was the Salvation Army or, or Goodwill. I think maybe it was Goodwill. And uh, after I moved into my new digs, I got a phone call from a woman who had tracked me down. She bought this painting from Goodwill. And she saw my name on it and she, went, she Googled me. Anyway, she tracked me down and she didn't know anything about the painting. She didn't know it was Rembrandt. She just loved the painting and had it hanging in her living room. But she wanted me to tell her the background story of the painting, you know, when I was taken aback and I, you know, I told her the story and uh, I guess she was happy with that. And I never asked her what she paid for it. I, you know, but uh, uh, it, I just find stuff like that interesting. And I go through stages. I've been going through a thing of, uh, I, I don't even know what you call it. It's not a, um, it, it, it's not steampunk, but there's an element of steampunk in it. And there's an element of uh, 
sarcastic fantasy. Um, uh, so, and, and I'll have a few of those in the show. Uh, it, they just, I basically started painting with an, I, a, you know, an idea and these weird paintings came about. I mean, they're not abstract. They're just, you know, people looking in mirrors in a strange way. Uh, uh, there's one with an elephant, uh, I, I, you know, so I, I found that to be, that's fun. I'm still doing stuff like that. Uh, I was fascinated for a while about, I don't know if you call them fairy tales, but these kids' stories, you know, the, the princess and the pea and those, those kind of things. Well, there, there's, um, there's a folk tale a story about a princess. I think it's, it might be Russian or it might be at least in that part of the world where the princess as a child befriends a bear in the woods. And every time she goes into the woods, she meets the bear and she grows up to be the beautiful princess uh, from a child. And at some point, she kisses the bear or does something, and the bear turns into a prince. And the, the story fascinated me. So I did a whole series of little girl with a bear, uh, you know, a woman with a bear, a bear and a kid sit, you know, sitting with their arms around each other. And I had fun, you know, fun doing my, my bear series. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, I, that's where I just sort of go from thing to thing, you know, but I always go back to portraits when I got lots of portraits of bearded, old bearded men and wrinkled women. And, uh, you know, where you really can see that they've lived a life that's, you know, filled with all kinds of ups and downs. And you can see it in their face, see it in their eyes. You know, uh, so, and those are the kind of faces that I, I really like. They're fun to do. And I can, you know, so. Uh, 